A very good evening as friends. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 6th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion. And you can see that today we have 8 articles and all the articles are from different topics. So it is really going to be interesting and helpful for your preliminary and mains preparation. Now without wasting much time, let's get into the first news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. The news is that yesterday the Supreme Court questioned the central government regarding demonetization. The court asked that whether the government rejected the objections from the Reserve Bank of India regarding demonetization policy. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about RBA and its main functions. Okay. First, let's start with RBA. Reserve Bank of India is the Central Bank of India. And it was established on 1st of April 1935. See, it is in accordance with the RBA Act 1934. Yes, you are hearing it right only. This RBA was formed before India's independence itself. Okay. So, RBI is a statutory body since it is formed according to the RBI Act 1934. Okay. And know that RBI is functioning under the Ministry of Finance. Note that during the initial days, the RBI share were mostly held by the non-government shareholders. So, in order to prevent the centralization of the shares in few hands, the RBI was nationalized. It was done on January 1, 1949. Okay. So, this is a brief about RBI. Now, let's talk about its composition. See, the affairs of the RBI are managed by the Central Board of Directors. And it is the apex body in the Reserve Bank's organizational structure. See, the Central Board is appointed by the government under the provisions of the Reserve Bank of India Act 1934. The Central Board consists of Governor, then four deputy governors of the Reserve Bank, then four directors who are nominated by the central government from the four local boards of RBI. Then it has ten directors who are nominated by central government. And finally, two government officials will be there who are also nominated by the central government. See, know that the governor is the chief executive of the Reserve Bank of India. This is about the composition of the RBI. Now, we will see about the important functions of the RBI one by one. Firstly, the RBI acts as a regulatory body and it regulates the Indian banking system. Secondly, the RBI acts as the banker to the government of India and states. See, it performs all the banking functions of the state and central government. The RBI also provides useful advice to the government on matters related to economic and monetary policy. Know that the RBI only manages the public debt of the government. Okay. And thirdly, RBI has a monopoly for printing the currency notes in the country. See, RBI has the sole right to issue currency notes of various denominations. Okay. Then fourthly, the Reserve Bank lends money to all the commercial banks of the country. For this reason only, we call RBI as bankers to bank. And finally, the Reserve Bank buys and sells foreign currencies. Then it also protects the country's foreign exchange funds. See, RBI sells the foreign currency in the foreign exchange market when its supply decreases in the economy. Then, the RBI buys the foreign currency in the foreign exchange market when its supply increases in the economy. So, this is how the foreign exchange is maintained. Okay. So, these are all some of the important functions of the RBI that you have to know. So, in a brief note, we have known what is RBI and what are all its major functions. This will be really helpful for attending any type of preliminary questions. So, these key points in mind. Now, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. This news article is about a petition filed in the Supreme Court. And in the petition, the petitioner seeked to unearth the correct history and the age of Taj Mahal. The Supreme Court dismissed the petition saying that let the history of Taj Mahal continue as it is. So this is about the news article and in this context let us see some important facts about Taj Mahal. See as we all know Taj Mahal was built by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to honor his wife Mumtaj Mahal. It is one of the seven wonders of the world and it houses the 
tomb of both Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan and it is located in Agra on the banks of Yamuna. See, the mausoleum architecture takes inspiration from Indian, Persian and Arabic architecture. It was built out of white Makrana marble that was sourced from the Indian state of Rajasthan. See, the Taj Mahal is located on top of an elevated square plinth that features four minarets standing at each of the four corners of the structure. The interior of the architecture was decorated with marble jelly works. Not only that, it also included calligraphy and Pietra Dura. Here, Pietra Dura is a decorative art. Okay, In this, colored materials are inserted into depressions that are formed in the base object. And jelly or pierced screens involves creating perforated slabs of stones. That is, slabs with holes in it. Okay, that's it. So, this was done during those times to ensure privacy and allow for airflow. Then another important feature of the Taj Mahal is its garden or the charbagh. See the uniqueness of Taj Mahal is that the majority of Mughal charbagh are rectangular with a central tomb that is the important piece of attraction is placed in the center. And there are gardens on all the four sides. But in the case of Taj Mahal, it is situated at the far end. This gives the Taj Mahal its magnificent look. See, these are important features of the Taj Mahal. Now, let us see the importance of Taj Mahal. Know that the Taj Mahal was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1983. Then it is also a part of the seven wonders of the world. All these official recognition and its marvelousness has made Taj Mahal an important tourist attraction. See, a lot of local and international tourists visit Taj Mahal every year. So, the Taj Mahal generates a lot of revenue for the government every year. Then in addition to this, by attracting foreign tourists, the Taj Mahal helps our country earn a lot of foreign exchange. It also helps in driving the local economy of Agra. So, this is all about the importance of Taj Mahal. And these are all some of the important facts that you have to know in exam perspective. Okay. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this text and context article. It talks about Ambedkar's educational details. The article traces the history of Ambedkar's education from the city of New York to London. See, the article reports that it was with the help of a scholarship granted by the Maharaja of Baroda, Ambedkar joined Columbia University, New York in the year 1913. After completing his MA, there he was admitted to Gray's Inn, which was located in London, to appear for the bar. Subsequent events following Ambedkar's journey from New York to London is what the article is about. In this context, let us learn about Ambedkar in detail. See, Ambedkar was born on 14th April 1891 in the town and military cantonment of Mo, which is now located in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Being born in a low caste, he was subjected to innumerous discriminations during his school days itself. After the initial year of struggle, Ambedkar's family moved to Mumbai in Maharashtra. There he was put into the famous Elphinstone High School and after graduating high school, he got admitted into Elphinstone College which was affiliated to the University of Bombay. Later, according to his writings, it was found out that Ambedkar was the first among his caste to get admission into the Elphinstone College. And by 1912, no, he completed his degree in economics and political science from Bombay University. The turning point of his life came in the year 1913. See, in that year, he was presented with a scholarship to study in the world-famous Columbia University, which was located in the New York. You note that Ambedkar was presented with this opportunity by the princely state of Baroda. The article given in today's newspaper tries to trace the events after Ambedkar set foot in New York. After graduating from Columbia University, he went on to study at London School of Economics where he simultaneously started working on a doctoral thesis. At the time of doing all this, he enrolled in Grayson to obtain a law degree. See how much Ambedkar studied simultaneously an economics degree with a doctoral thesis attached with it and a separate law degree. 
Then in the year 1917, no, he finally returned to India. And this was after his scholarship from the Baroda state got entered. Okay. So this is all about Ambedkar's educational history. See, today's news article only talks about the brief period of Ambedkar. That is from 1913 to 1917. But I discussed about the previous 20 years of Ambedkar to give you all a better understanding about him. See, now let's shift our attention to the next part of Ambedkar's life. This part of his life was primarily dedicated towards the upliftment of scheduled classes in India. After returning to India in the year 1917, he worked in different jobs to take care of his family. Being a recipient of caste-based discrimination all through his life, his attention shifted towards welfare of the scheduled classes. See, by 1927, Ambedkar had desired to launch active movements against untouchability. He began with public movements and marches to open up public drinking water resources. Then he also began a struggle for the right of scheduled classes to enter Hindu temples. See, the famous Mahat Satyagraha took place in the year 1927 and in the year 1930, Kalaram Temple Movement took place. Mahat Satyagraha and Kalaram Movement are the two major mass movements led by Ambedkar in his initial years. Okay? Then, after leading these two mass movements, Ambedkar tried to obtain representation for the scheduled classes in the legislative assemblies. He stressed the need for separate electorates for them in the second roundtable conference at London. This led to the famous Pune Pact between him and Gandhiji. In this pact with Gandhi, Ambedkar, even though not wholeheartedly, but accepted joint electorates with reserved seats for scheduled classes in place of separate electorate. Now coming to the political career of Ambedkar. See, Ambedkar had founded two political parties. In 1936, Ambedkar founded the Independent Labour Party, which contested in the 1937 Bombay election to the Central Legislative Assembly. This is the first political party founded by Ambedkar. Then after 20 long years, in the year 1956, Ambedkar had announced the establishment of the Republican Party of India. This party contested in the 1957 Lok Sabha elections and won six seats. This is the second political party founded by Ambedkar. Okay. Now coming to the role of Ambedkar in the constitution making. See, as you all know, Ambedkar was selected as the chairman of drafting committee. See, drafting committee was the most important of all the other committees created during the constitution making of India. And the drafting committee and its members were very influential in Indian constitution making during the committee stages and also in the deliberations of the constituent assembly. The majority of the debates in the constituent assembly revolved around the draft constitutions prepared by the drafting committee. See, out of 166 sittings of the constituent assembly, nearly 114 were spent debating the drafting constitutions. This shows the importance of drafting committee in the constitution making of India. Then after all this, in the month of October 1956, just before his death, Ambedkar converted to Buddhism with the majority of his followers. Finally, Ambedkar died on 6th of December 1956. With this, we have come to the end of the news article discussion. See, through this discussion, we learned some important points regarding Ambedkar. And these all know you can directly utilize it in your main answers. Whenever you are asked with roles of Ambedkar, you can place these points to enhance your answers. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this editorial news article. See this news article says that a number of public interest litigations have been filed in the Supreme Court. And it is all regarding forced religious conversion. According to the editorial, these PALs are clogging up or slowing down the functioning of the Supreme Court. The editorial later goes on to talk about anti-conversion law of Gujarat and the issues in it. This is about the editorial. But in our discussion today, let us first cover the basics that is the constitutional provisions regarding freedom of religion. After that, let us see the points mentioned in the news article. Okay. Now I have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can just go through it. As you all know, in India, the freedom of religion is one of the fundamental rights. 
It is explicitly mentioned in the Article 25, 26, 27 and 28 of the Indian Constitution. First, let us take Article 25. Article 25 guarantees freedom of conscience, profession, practice and propagation of religion. To put it in simple words, this article guarantees people's right to believe in a religion, right to express the religious belief, then right to take part in a religious ritual and ceremonies and finally to propagate the religion of their choice. See, an important thing that you have to remember about this article is the right provided by this article is available to both citizens and non-citizens. And the freedom guaranteed by this article does not come without any restrictions. See, the first major restriction on rights guaranteed under Article 25 is, while people practice their freedom of religion, they must not violate public order, morality, health and other provisions relating to fundamental rights. This restriction is placed because without this restriction, people will practice social evils like sati and untouchability under the guise of freedom of religion. That is why there are some restrictions. Okay. Then the second restriction is that the state can make laws to regulate any economic, financial, political or other secular activity associated with religious practice. Okay. So this is about Article 25. Now moving on to see Article 26, it guarantees the freedom to manage religious affairs. See, according to this article, every religion denominations has the following rights. First one is that every religion has the right to establish religious institutions. These religious institutions can manage the religion and also the charitable activity of the religion. The second one is these religious institutions can manage their own affairs in regards to any religious matter. See, the third one is straightforward. Every religious denomination has the right to acquire both movable and immovable property. And finally, the religious denomination can administer their property according to law. Okay. So, these are the rights guaranteed to the religious denominations according to Article 26. Now, moving on to restrictions. See, rights guaranteed under Article 26 have restrictions based only on public safety, morality and health. Here, if you notice, Article 25 has one additional restriction regarding other provisions relating to fundamental rights. This is the difference between Article 25 and 26. Then another difference is that, while Article 25 deals with the right of an individual, Article 26 deals with the rights of a religious denomination. Okay? And I have used the word religious denomination a number of times while discussing. So what does this word religious denomination mean? This word is not defined in the constitution. It was defined by the Supreme Court in the SP Mittal vs. Union of India case. So according to this judgment, no, a religious denomination is a group of people who have a shared faith and who are identified by a distinct name. Okay. So, in the future, if we aspirants form a group and start worshipping a mythical being like a centenar and call ourselves centenarians, then we would be granted the status of religious denomination. Then our religion can also enjoy the rights guaranteed under Article 26. So, this is about Article 26. Now, moving on to see Article 27. This article is also very straightforward. According to this article, no one can be compelled to pay any taxes for the promotion or preservation of any religious denomination. This provision is inserted to prevent the government from favoring one religion over another. Also, if you notice carefully the wording of this Article 27, it mentions that no person shall be compelled to pay any taxes. So, charges can be imposed. Okay. For example, the government imposes some entry fee on religious sites. This is not violative of Article 27. As the charges like the entry fee are used mainly for the secular management of the religious site and not for the promotion of the particular religion. Okay. This is all about Article 27. Now let us take Article 28. See the article says that no person can be compelled to receive religious instructions or perform religious worship in certain educational institutions. See, this article no, classifies the educational institutions into four types. 
they are institutions wholly maintained by the state institution administered by the state but established under any endowment or trust then institutions recognized by the state and institutions receiving aid from the state here in the educational institutions wholly maintained by the state no religious instruction can be given okay then if you take the educational institution recognized by the state and those receiving aid from the state religious instruction can be given but the students can either choose to attend the instruction or they can choose not to do okay then finally take the case of the educational institutions administered by the state but established under any endowment or trust see in such kind of educational institution no religious instructions are allowed to be disseminated these are the rights to freedom of religion that are mentioned in our constitution now having seen this let us take up the editorial article according to the editorial the issue is around the gujarat freedom of religious act specifically section 5 of the act section 5 of this act says that for anyone to change their religion either directly or indirectly they must get the prior permission of the district magistrate here directly means if someone takes up a new religion on their own and indirectly means if someone changes their religion due to interfaith marriage see the gujarat high court put a stay on section 5 due to its controversial nature so public interest litigations have been filed in the supreme court to bring back section 5 of the gujarat freedom of religion act to curb deceitful religious conversion see we already saw that gujarat high court has put a stay in section 5 it has taken this decision based on the following reasons first one is prior permission requirement would force someone to disclose one's religious belief or any change of faith This is against the right to privacy guaranteed under article 21 of the constitution. Then the second one is as we saw earlier article 25 ensures freedom to practice profess the religion of one's choice. Seeking permission from district magistrate before making a conscious choice of conversion of religion is against the rights guaranteed under this article 25. Okay? So these are the two reasons provided by the high court before placing a stay on section 5 of the Gujarat Freedom of Religious Act. So these are some of the points mentioned in the news article. So that's all regarding this news article. See through this editorial we covered the static portion which is regarding the freedom of religion the articles under which it is guaranteed. Then we came to the news article and we saw what is this Gujarat Freedom of Religious Act. and why it is under stay by the high court okay so these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this editorial article in this article no the author speaks about the issues in the climate negotiation process that is in the cop 27 or the conference of parties 27 of the unfccc then he highlights the need for a scientific approach towards climate change mitigation and finally he speaks about the climate injustices brought by the negotiation process so in this context let's learn about the points given in the news article in detail before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference kindly go through it now first let's understand about conference of parties 27 As we all know the conference of the parties that is COP is the global decision making body of the UN that is United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. See 198 countries who are parties to the UNFCCC meet every year to review the progress towards mitigation of climate change. In November this year no Egypt hosted the 27th session of COP. On 20th November The COP27 was concluded with a historic decision to establish and operationalize a loss and damage fund. See regarding this loss and damage fund also we saw in our discussion itself right. Know that the loss and damage fund aims to provide the financial assistance to most vulnerable nations who are impacted by the effects of climate change. So this is a brief about the COP27. With these basics Now first let's understand the problems with the current negotiating process in the COP27. See the author says that there are three problems with the current negotiating process. Now we'll see them one by one. 
Firstly, the author says that the citizen in developed countries are not aware about certain factors. See, in developed countries, two-thirds of their national emissions of carbon dioxide come from their diet, transport and residential and commercial sectors. These consumption sectors together constitute the major share of their GDP. And it reflects the urban lifestyles of citizens in developed countries. See, this is the first problem that the current negotiating process does not take into account. Then secondly, the author says that the negotiating process ignores global well-being. See, the global well-being also depends upon the urbanization of the developing country's population. This process requires fossil fuels for infrastructure and energy. But the negotiating process did not address this point also. And thirdly, the author says that the developing countries are in need of vast quantities of cement and steel for their infrastructure development. See, during this process of infrastructure development, the emissions are seen as an essential one. But the problem here is, the current negotiating process is not considering this also. Overall, the author says that the developing countries are in the phase of late urbanization and they account for more than half of the annual emissions. But in such a phase of urbanization, the developing countries cannot afford many of the new technologies that help in quick decarbonization. So this will result in shrinking of policy space and human rights of the developing countries. And this endangers the effort of them to achieve comparable levels of well-being with those of the developed countries. So here the author says that the just concerns of the developing countries are not taken into account in the climate negotiations. And the reason for that is there is no proper agenda for the meetings. See these are the problems with the current negotiating process as said by the author. Now moving on. Now let's see about the need for a scientific approach towards the climate change mitigation process. See the main objective of the global climate treaty is to avoid a concentration of cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide. The climate treaty also prevents dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system and it enables sustainable economic development. But the problem here is that there is no scientific approach towards emission reduction. See, as we all know, in the 2015 Paris Agreement, the world countries agreed to a 1.5 degree centigrade global temperature goal. And in the year 2018 also, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recommended that net emissions needed to zero out around 2050. See, these agreements and recommendations are based on scientific analysis by the experts. But in 2021, at COP26 in Glasgow, the negotiators advocated for zero coal use and this is to reduce future emissions. See, the author says that this initiative was not based on science and it ignored the key findings of the IPCC. See, the IPCC found that the centrality of emission reduction is based on the carbon budget. That is, cumulative emissions are scientifically linked with the temperature goal of the particular nation. But the negotiations made in the COP are abruptly focusing on zero coal use. See, this creates problems for the developing nations which rely on coal for their energy production. So overall, the author advocates for a scientific approach towards the climate change mitigation process. Okay, now moving on, let's see what are all the climate injustices made to the developing nations by the climate negotiating process. See, the author says that climate injustice flows from the negotiation process and it does not flow from the text of the climate treaty, which was made through common consensus. See, the author also listed out four major injustices. Now, we will see them one by one. Firstly, the author says that the negotiation process rejected the historical responsibility of the emissions by the developed nations. And he said that they are shifting the burden to developing countries like China and India. So, this is the first injustice. Secondly, the author says that the climate negotiation agenda was set around globalized material flows and that causes global warming, right? 
So it focuses on the material flows in the developing countries like coal and other fossil fuels. But it does not focus on the wasteful use of energy by the developed nations. So this is the second injustice. Then thirdly, the author says that at the COP21 in Paris, the developed countries agreed to $100 billion for the developing countries. See, it acts as an incentive for developing countries to reduce their emissions. But the goal of $100 billion has not materialized and it constitutes a breach of trust. This is the third injustice. And finally, the author says that the longer term trend of emissions has been ignored. See, it is estimated that in 2035, with one-sixth of the global population, the developed country's share in emission will still be 30%. But Asia's emission with half the world's population will only rise to 40%. This rise in Asia will remain within the limits. But the pressures on developing countries to further reduce emission will displace their human rights. See, these are all the four main climate injustices brought through negotiation process. So, the author advocates for climate justice by keeping in mind the aspirations of the developing countries. And finally, the author appreciated India's initiative of life or you can say lifestyle for environment. See, life is an India-led global mass movement. This movement nudges the individual and community action to preserve the environment. The author says that this initiative will help in reducing the wasteful consumption of natural resources. To conclude, the climate negotiations should focus on diverse solutions rather than shifting the emission burden towards the developing nations. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article. So, through this news article discussion, we analyzed what are all the injustices or what are all the burden that is put on the developing nations. See, these points all you can use in your mains to highlight when you are asked a question like analyze the COP27. Okay. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. The news article reports about a petition filed in Madras High Court. The petitioners have requested to upload the motor accident related documents on the crime and criminal tracking networks and systems portal that is cctns portal okay so how is this portal related here to know that let us have a brief discussion about cctns see it was started in the year 2009 and it aims at creating a comprehensive and integrated system for enhancing the efficiency and effectiveness of policing for this, it adopts two tools. One is the principle of e-governance. Second is the creation of nationwide networking infrastructure for evolution of IT-enabled state-of-the-art tracking system around investigation of crime and detection of criminals. See, based on this, its objective are manifold. Mainly to make the police functioning citizen-friendly and also more transparent. This is by automating the functioning of police stations. See, it aims to improve delivery of citizen-centric services through effective usage of ICT. Then it also aims to provide the investigating officers of the civil police with tools, technology and information. This is to facilitate investigation of crime and detection of criminals. Okay. Then by doing this, it aims to improve police functioning in various other areas such as law and order, traffic management, etc. See, facilitating interaction and sharing of information among police stations, districts, state or union territory headquarters and other police agencies is one of the major objectives. And it also aims to assist senior police officers in better management of police force. See, not only this, it will facilitate keeping track of the progress of cases and above all, the aim is reducing manual and redundant records keeping, etc. So, by fulfilling these objectives, no, the CCTNS system facilitates a pan-India search of crime and criminal records of individuals. How? This is through a national database. Okay. And the system envisages nationwide networking. So, it covers 35 states or union territories and links 
14000 police stations and 6000 higher officers across the country such a networking enables seamless sharing of information between police stations state officers and security agencies okay have a look at this image it represents the networking so in short this system modernizes the police force in the country are the police force only beneficiaries no the citizens also get benefited how because cctns provides citizen interface also this enables them to register complaints and to avail citizen services here note that the main project implementation agency is national crime records bureau that is ncrb which works under the overall guidance of ministry of home affairs okay Also the CCTNS is a mission mode project under national e-governance plan. See a mission mode project is an individual project within the national e-governance plan and it focuses on one aspect of electronic governance, okay? Such projects have clearly defined objectives, scopes and implementation timelines and milestones. Then it also has measurable outcomes and service levels. Okay so overall the cctns fulfills the basic principles of national e governance plan which is a centralized planning and decentralized implementation okay so that's all about this news article see in this news article we saw about an important topic which is cctns that is crime and criminal tracking network and systems so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article This news article provides us an interesting fact about the presence of leopards in Bengaluru. See already 40 leopards are found in Banargatta National Park in Bengaluru, but now it is estimated that around 30 to 35 leopards are also present just in the vicinity of Bengaluru city. Why this is interesting? Because even though previously outskirts of Bengaluru used to be leopard habitat, but the expansion of the city affected these habitats so the recent estimation shows that leopards are still surviving in these areas now before moving to next news article let us revise few facts about leopard okay say so it is actually scientifically known as panthera patis it is the most widely distributed and adaptable member of the family felidae Historically the species range spanned across various areas and it covered wide area. You can see that in this map. See it included all of the sub-Saharan and North Africa, the Middle East and Asia Minor, then South and Southeast Asia and it even extended to the Amur Valley in the Russian Far East. Then it also include the island ranges of Sri Lanka, Java, Zanzibar and Kanjian. So what kind of habitat it prefers from the range of countries itself we can say that it prefers almost every kind of habitat from the rainforest of the tropics to deserts and temperate regions okay but how is it possible for leopards to exist in all these habitats because leopards are quite adaptable with respect to habitat and food requirements This is one of the reasons why they are found in intensively cultivated and inhabited areas as well as found near urban developments okay note that the indian subspecies of panthera pardus is the panthera pardus fusca among all the subspecies indian leopard retains the largest population size and range outside africa then it is found in all the forested habitats in india but it is absent only in the arid deserts and above the timber line in the himalayas okay in the himalayas the indian subspecies occurs within the same geographical range that of snow leopards but up to 5200 meter only see the report called status of leopards in india 2018 provides the exact numerical data According to this report of Ministry of Environment India now has 12852 leopards This is an increase from the year 2014 when the leopard population in the India was just 7910 So more than 60% increase in population has been recorded you can see that right Also look at this table 
Among the states, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka and Maharashtra recorded the highest leopard estimates. Okay. But even though the population of leopards is widely distributed, still the species face many threats. It includes habitat loss, prey depletion, conflict and poaching. For saving the species only, leopard has been accorded highest protection in India. It is protected under the Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Then it is also listed vulnerable in the IUCN red list and included in the appendix 1 of the sites. Okay. So that's all regarding this news article. See through this news article discussion we saw about the species leopard clearly and this will be much helpful for your preliminary examination. And with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. The article reports about the findings of recent PMI survey. We'll understand what PMI is first, then we'll see the data, okay? See, the PMI stands for Purchasing Managers Index. It is a survey-based economic indicator and it is designed to provide a timely insight into the business conditions and the health of the global economy. Where this PMI is used? It is widely used to anticipate changing economic trends in official data such as GDP. See, it is also used as an alternative to know about economic performance and business conditions. Thus, PMI data are used by financial and corporate professionals to better understand where economies and markets are headed and it helps them to uncover opportunities. Okay, so the index is produced for more than 40 economies worldwide and it is compiled and produced globally by a company called IHS market. But then why news mentions as S&P Global India Manufacturing PMI? It is because IHS market has merged with another company called S&P Global. Okay. Therefore, this IHS market is now part of S&P Global and together they deliver data, technology and expertise that accelerates process. Now coming back to PMI, know that originally PMI was compiled for manufacturing sector only. Later it was extended to include other sectors such as services, construction and retail. We have seen about manufacturing PMI many times and also news is talking about services PMI only. So let me tell you what is the services PMI. See, the services PMI was introduced in 1996 and it was introduced to accompany the existing manufacturing PMI. But why sudden need for this? It is because the business analysts wanted a better understanding of the changing business conditions in the wider economy. And we know that globally, service sector accounts for a larger proportion of GDP than manufacturing for most of the developed economies. Okay. So they realize the need for services PMI. See the services PMI measures the changes in total services business activity. Basically the sectors covered include consumer excluding retail, transport, information, communication, finance, insurance, real estate and business services. Okay. Now in this list you can find the sub indices under services PMI. See, now let us see what the news says. The service sector recorded the fastest output growth in three months. This shows that the services sector continued to rebound in number also. And this expansion happened due to demand strength, successful marketing and a sustained upturn in sales. Because of this, the services PMI increased to 56.4 from 55.1 in October. See, as per the findings, no, the sub-index of input costs increased at the second fastest rate since July. Input cost refers to the average prices of all the inputs this month compared with the situation one month ago. Here, purchases of goods and services, staff cost, rents, etc. are all included. The worrying fact is the rise in the input cost burden is partly transferred to the consumers. So the prices charged for the provision of services in India continue to increase in number also. What this denotes is inflation. Second notable finding is new business from overseas. So an increase in number since the onset of COVID-19. 
more importantly the finding shows that employment rose that is job creation increased then employment has risen at a solid pace and it was also the quickest to rise in over 3 years this rise is attributed to rising demand and sharp improvements in business confidence okay so that's all regarding this news article See in this news article, we covered about an important topic for your prelims because this PMI topic can directly be put into a preliminary type of question. And today we covered regarding the services PMI. See regarding manufacturing PMI, we had covered many times. Just go and search for it and watch it. So that's all regarding this news article. With these key points in mind, now let's move to the next news article discussion. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. See today we have 5 questions in which 4 I will be discussing and 1 will be a quiz question for you. Okay. Now look at the first question. See it is regarding the Banargeta National Park. Here 3 statements are given and you are asked to find the correct statement. Okay. Now look at the first statement. It is spread over 2 districts. See, know that Banarkata National Park was declared in 1974 initially with an area of 106.83 km square and it had then comprised two reserved forests spread over in the districts of Bengaluru Urban and Bengaluru Rural. So subsequently in 2011, no, Kodihali range of Ramanagara Territorial Division was added to the National Park. Then the total area of this national park is now 260.51 km square. So it is comprising of 13 reserved forests spread over the districts of Bengaluru Urban and Bengaluru Rural and Ramanagara. So statement 1 is incorrect because it is spread across the 3 districts that I mentioned now. Okay. See as I always say when you have multiple statements. If you know that one statement is incorrect and the question is demanding for correct statements, you can directly go for elimination technique. So what is the answer for this question? Yes, it is option B, 2 and 3 only. But still, let us verify whether the other two statements are correct or not. Now look at the statement 2. It shares border with Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. This statement is correct. Because this Banargata National Park is situated in southeastern corner of the state of Karnataka and borders with Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary in the south. Then the sanctuary also borders with the Thali, Thali Extension and Jawalgiri Reserved Forest of Tamil Nadu on its southeastern boundaries. Okay. Now look at statement 3. It is one of the natural habitats of Asian elephants. See this statement is correct. Also note that the boundary of this national park no, has highly irregular shape. So the forest of the national park are mostly of scrub type with mixed dry deciduous patches in the sheltered valleys. See there are some very good patches of medri bamboo. Then animals found in the park include panther, elephant, sloth bird, spotted deer, grey langur, bonnet macaw, wild boar etc etc. Occasional sighting of a tiger is also reported here. Okay. And as I said, regarding the Asian elephants, this Banargata National Park has breeding population of elephants. That is why I said statement 3 is correct. Okay. So what is the answer for this question? Option B, 2 and 3 only is the answer. Okay. Now take the second question. See, it is regarding the cultural world heritage sites. That is in India. Okay. Here two statements are given. So you have to go through both these statements to arrive at the answer. Now take the statement 1. There are in total 40 cultural world heritage sites in India. See this statement is wrong. There are 40 world heritage sites in India. In that 32 are cultural world heritage sites and 7 are natural world heritage sites. And one is a mixed site which is the Kanchenjunga National Park. Okay. So that is why statement 1 is wrong. Now moving on to the second statement. Maharashtra is the state with most number of cultural world heritage sites. See this statement is correct. Maharashtra has 5 cultural world heritage sites and it is the highest for any state in India. See the cultural world heritage sites located in Maharashtra, Ajanta Caves, Elora Caves, Elephanta Caves, then Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus and Victorian Gothic and Art and Deco ensembles. Okay, so these are the things that are found in Maharashtra. Now coming to the question, it is demanding for correct statements. So your answer here will be option B. 2 only is the correct statement. Okay. 
Now moving on to the third question. See, it is regarding the Reserve Bank of India. First statement, it is the regulatory body for the capital market in India. See, this statement is incorrect because SEBI is a regulatory body for the capital market in India. Whereas RBI is a regulatory body for the financial market in India. See, keenly note that here the question is demanding for incorrect statements. So, you cannot just go for elimination with statement 1. Okay, you know that statement 1 is incorrect. Now, moving on to see whether statement 2 is correct or not. The governor of the RBI is appointed by the president on recommendations of the union government. See, this statement is also incorrect. See, the governor of the RBI is appointed by the union government straightly. Okay. So, with this itself, you would have found that the answer is option A, 1 and 2 only. But still, let's see the third statement. It manages the foreign exchange reserves in India. Yes, regarding this also, we saw in the discussion, right? So, statement 3 is correct. Since the question is demanding for incorrect statements, your answer here is option A, 1 and 2 are incorrect. Now, moving on to the last question. It is regarding the CCT in this discussion. See, look at the first statement. Crime and criminal information system and common integrated police application are precursors to the CCTNS. See, this statement is correct. Yes, these two are the precursors to the crime and criminal tracking network and systems. Note this information, this we did not discuss in the discussion. Okay. Now, look at statement 2. Interoperable criminal justice system integrates the CCTNS with the e-codes and e-prisons databases. See, this statement is also correct because this interoperable criminal justice system no, is an initiative to enable seamless transfer of data and information among different pillars of the criminal justice systems like courts, police, jails and forensic science laboratories from one platform. And this ICJS or the interoperable criminal justice system no, is aiming to integrate the CCTNS project with the e-codes and e prison databases. This is in the first instance and with the other pillars of the criminal justice system like forensic, prosecution, juvenile homes and a nationwide fingerprint database of criminals in a phased manner. Okay, so that second statement is also correct. Now since the question is demanding for correct statements, your answer here is option C, both 1 and 2 are correct. So that's all for today's preliminary practice question discussion and here is your quiz question. See, go through the question. We have already discussed this in our discussion itself. So, if you had keenly observed the discussion, it is very much easy for you to answer this question. Find the answer and post it in the comment section. And the right answer will also be posted in the comment section itself. And displayed here are mains practice question for you. See, go through each and every question and try writing answer for this question. It is going to help in your mains preparation. Okay. And that's all for today's discussion. If you like this video, do like, share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar Eyes Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.